This is the third Tuesday of the month Wapaka City Council meeting. Let's get going here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it is six o'clock. A little different tonight. Um, we have the Inland Lakes District. Uh, we do that on an annual basis. And the uh, Inland Lakes starts with a public hearing. And then after the public hearing, we actually go through the uh, agenda of the Inland Lakes District. Uh, usually doesn't take very long, right, Carol? Okay, um, but uh, we'll get going on that. Um, we have a uh, public hearing for the Inland Lakes District. I call this meeting to order. In attendance, our uh, commissioners are Peterson, Mayo, Whitman, Hackett, uh, Mayor Brian Smith, Keelan, Chestnut, and Prochaski. So we have seven present at this time. Uh, the purpose of the meeting is just to discuss the agenda for the public hearing. At this time, we would take testimony in favor of uh, the uh, agenda for the public hearing. Anybody would like to make comments on that, please step up to the podium and give your name or address for the record. I limit your time to three minutes or less. In favor of? During council? Tell me what your public input is and then I'll tell you. Okay, then you're right. You will have an opportunity to speak later. Absolutely. Okay, any testimony in favor of? Hearing none, uh, do we have any testimony in opposition to the agenda for the Inland Lakes? Any testimony against? Uh, seeing none, uh, I declare this uh, public hearing closed at 6.02 p.m. So we're gonna go right into the uh, Inland Lakes District meeting. Again, as I said, this is an annual meeting that we hold these in August, either the first or second meeting in August. Um, and I will call this meeting to order at uh, 6.03 p.m. Uh, same individuals are in attendance as well as staff uh, members. Looks like all staff members are here today with us. Um, you have an agenda. I, I would need a motion to approve that agenda. So moved. A motion by Keelan, second by Hackett, that we approve the agenda as printed. Well, I should say there is one handout on your desk. It's that map of the Mirror and Shadow Lake. So with that one addition. All in favor of the agenda, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Uh, in your packet, uh, you have uh, minutes of last uh, last year's meeting. Uh, we ask uh, that if you have any corrections on that or any questions on the, on the minutes from last year, uh, to, let's discuss that at this time. Otherwise, we would like uh, a motion to approve those minutes so we can place those on file. I move to approve the minutes. Second. Motion by uh, Chestnut, second by Keelan, that we approve of the minutes from last year's meeting, which was held on August 15th, 2017. Discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Against? Motion carried. Okay, and then we have uh, resolution number IL. 47, which is basically the the budget. So in your packet also is a budget for 2019. And uh, I think, Carol, this is probably your time. Please just give your name and address for the record, please. My name is Carol Elvery, and I live at 33 Shadow Woods Lane. Uh, thank you for an opportunity for inviting me to come up. Um, 
but we you know, just not say a whole lot. But I, I want to thank the staff support this year. Of course, we've had Aaron, and then that's when Aaron left. We've had Andrew, and he picked up the ball real fast, and Justin. And Josh Werner actually has been a lot of support in terms of getting information on the website and on uh, Win TV and the radio. So that's been helpful. And Josh Peterson, of course, has been helpful uh, with his feet on the ground many times. Uh, obviously, we support this budget. Uh, it doesn't leave a whole lot at the end of the year, but believe me, that's pretty much bare bones as far as what Friends of the Lake does and sends and, and spends on the lakes. And there, there's certainly nothing here that would do any um, emergency of any other thing other than try to continue to control the uh, Eurasian water milfoil and some curly leaf pondweed. The maps that you have show the colored dots where it was found this summer. Um, and the red dots mean a large infestation, and the yellow dots mean some scattered plants. Um, and one place that I don't think is a Carol, red dot. Can I stop you just for a yeah. second? Josh, is there a, why, a reason why her speaker is breaking in and out? Might okay. be too, I, I lowered it. Maybe I should stick it back up. No, it's it's the speaker. Oh, okay. So go ahead. All it's right. just a. Uh, well, anyway, um, you can. I'm going to borrow a map. You see, the north end of Mirror Lake gets a lot, and um, that's basically a wind-driven, probably, uh, that it lands up that way because of the wind. Shadow has it scattered all around, um, and and that's we pay divers to come. And, and pull it. It, it. It's deep enough that snorkelers can't do it and hand pullers can't do it. It gets down deep. Uh, they were at, they figured they were at least at 13 and down to 20 feet the days they came. Anyway, oh, okay. So I just say, and that's really the other the other money that's in that 1650 for contract services are the water samples that Pat Cuellar and her husband collect every year um, in November and in April, and then they test the water every month through from those months to the till November <coughs> for uh, oxygen and oxygen, yeah, and dissolved oxygen and temperature and the clarity. So that gives us a handle on both the chemistry and the algae in the lakes. Uh, and what's really kind of special about Mirror and Shadow Lakes those records have been kept since the 70s because back when the Clean Water Act passed and Mirror and Shadow Lake got chosen for attention, uh, those they have the records have gone on. And then when uh, the Dave Furstenberg picked it up, they, he continued submitting it, and Steve and Pat submitted it. So we have a very long record that he and I really liked, and it's really nice to see kind of how the lake. Uh, I would say that uh, the labor of the volunteers, uh, for the, especially the deal with the aquatic invasive species, can be in kind for meeting grant monies. And so since we haven't had no grants, active grants for the last several years, uh, we give those hours to Golden Sands, RC&D, because they got the grant to do AIS for Wapaka County. And it's under those auspices that they help us. This summer they did, they spent several days here because they did a full plant survey of both lakes. Plus an extra day they came back to do the survey and map the, uh, uh, the aquatic invasive species. And plus, of course, the, the, let's see, they spent four days here uh, diving. So we've had a lot of help from Golden Sands this year. And we'll give them all our hours for that also. And other years I've told you about other problems and some of them are still existing, but I think uh, that Justin is working on some of them, and Andrew has worked on some of them, and I feel like at least we're getting going to get some some benefit and some work on that, and that's going to work well. And other than that, any questions? I uh, have a comment or a question. I, I'm concerned that your budget is, frankly, skimpy, and I would like to see more money allocated because I think we are going to have serious problems with Eurasian water milfoil in the near future. Um, just in the last couple of years, it has spread extensively already. And I would hate to see us 
end up with a, a lake like uh, what we find in Wyoiga or Iola. So I'm I'm concerned that we don't have enough money budgeted. Well, let, let me speak to that a little bit. Um, they don't like it. Uh, Wyoiga and Iola don't like it when I tell them. But actually, their lake is different from our two lakes. Their lake's an impoundment lake, just like our Cary Mill Farm. <clears throat> and so that has a that problem is worse than Mirror and Shadow. One of the challenges for Mirror, for basically Mirror and Shadow, is that channel between the two. Um, I don't like herbicide. I wouldn't support herbicide, and herbicide is very expensive. And if you did that every year, you'd be spending a whole lot more than sixteen hundred dollars. Um, the reason I don't is because it kills natural plants along with the bad stuff. But it, it won't even work for us because it's also in the channel between the two lakes. And when you do the herbicide, you have to have it dwell. They have to have a certain amount of hours of dwell time. Well, there's a, a current in a channel. And so there's no way that there'll ever be dwell time to treat the milfoil in the channel which means that the channel will always feed it basically out into shadow more than into mirror, um, but nonetheless. So our really only option is aggressive hand or diver pulling. So yeah, it may not be enough money, and all we need is a, the DO meter to die, <laughs> and we're out of, out of schlitz, you might say. But we will have to do both things. Anybody have any other? Are, are you making a recommendation or a, a, a motion, Alan? I'm sorry, or were you just? Um, I would like to make a motion that uh, that we increase the budget, but I'm not sure. I, I mean, if <laughs> if Friends of Mirror and Shadow Lake are not supportive of it, I'm not sure that it would go very far. We've been living off the your tax that you got what 25 years ago. Um, and we've been trying real hard to conserve it for years and years and years. I mean, any any expenses that either of us use, any of us use, we you aren't ch ever charged for. They mail all their water samples in free. You know, I pay my convention. Nobody, none of the people in Friends of Mirror Shadow Lake are charging any money for anything they do. But uh, we can spend time. We do bug you. That's the worst part. Well, what are the prospects for getting any grants? Are you prepared to talk to that? I don't know. I, I've got the information. I, knew, I do know that when we um, went over this budget, Justin and Carol and I, and, and talked through this, um, we talked about a few opportunities. I checked with Aaron on some opportunities, uh, but have not followed up on them completely yet. There are some DNR grants, but a lot of those are just by brief reading them, they're for new places where you're coming up with a new solution to a problem, not necessarily maintenance or pulling, which is kind of where we're at right now. Um, so most of those big time grants are for a new lake or a new operation. Um, so there's, if there's anything out there, it's, it's slim to nil at this point that I have found. I would have to do some more research and some more contact with DNR um, to see if there's anything that we could use uh, in that process. So. Yeah, that's just basically what I've found. Is, you know, the same sort of thing. That the only the only maintenance and containment project is for plant management permits. So we don't need permits to pull our stuff. So it's really of no. Steve, Pete, I just see a little concern here with budget going down about two thousand dollars each year now you're going to have a balance at the end of next year you're good good for next year yeah but only have 450 then where are we going to be after that so and i don't see that it's going to the costs are going to go down because i, oh, I you know yeah, i see it's if a, anything i'm going to sure come to a crossroads next year for sure for sure yeah we we can Unless get by we find something you know aaron in the minutes aaron said he was going to check into some grants way back in the year ago minutes but who knows if that gets Kathy, uh, this is an Inland Lakes district, and if we chose to put money into that, um, I guess the procedure would be that's a separate line 
on the taxes? It would be a separate tax levy line on the tax bill. Okay. And does that count against our levy no, as new? it doesn't count because they're a separate taxing jurisdiction. Okay. So and they would be set, they would be also set up um, for levy limits. So it, once they set the levy, because right now it's zero, once they set the levy, it's going to be based on, again, net new construction. They would never be able to levy any more than what they, that is allowable under levy limits. So as long as they stay at zero, they're okay. But if they ask for $100 this year, they're only going to get $100 next year. They would only be taxing for $100, yeah. Then on. So if we're going to do this, we need to do a lot more research or, or discussion on what that dollar amount should be on an annual basis. Correct. So it isn't quite as simple as that. Now, I think, uh, and I got to ask Henry or Sandy here from a clerk standpoint or, or Kathy, we can amend this budget at a later date, or do we have to wait until next year? Um, no, you could amend this budget. The biggest thing would be is, is if you have are going to levy a tax, then it would have to be so that it can go on this tax roll. So it'd have to be before December 1st. Correct. If you were to do that. So I don't know that we have enough information tonight, really, to, to add to the budget revenue to the, add any revenue. But I think uh, your concerns are heard, and, and I think we all see the bottom line next year. It's going to be at $450. I did some quick um, numbers for you. Um, $25,000 um, on an equal, on what we have an equalized value would be about five cents. Um, so on a $110,000 average home, which is what we have in Wapaka, it would be six dollars and seventy six cents on the tax bill. And every taxpayer every taxpayer in Wapaka would have to pay this right. in, whether you live on the in whether you live on the lake or not. Okay. So we're not I mean, and you said what, twenty five thousand? Uh, yeah. Just a, as a, a ballpark figure that if you did it twenty five thousand now, you could levy twenty five thousand one time and not levy for a while. And then come back and, and levy again with, with um, that you have with tax levy, levy limits. Okay. So, Alan, if you would like, or council, if you would like to see something like that this year, or if you would rather wait till next year, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just opening this up for you, then we, or we should have some kind of meeting to discuss how we're going to handle I mean, right now, it was a recommendation from staff that this would be the budget. You know. Right. And I think I'd like to revisit the yet this year, and I know FOMS will be meeting again uh, soon, and perhaps that can be a topic of discussion at that time, and perhaps look at coming up with a new budget um, prior to the end of the year, and we'll have a discussion again at, at one of these meetings. I rest of the council are you okay with that so there would probably be a special meeting of the inland lakes uh, before the end of the year before before december one to discuss whether i mean we're not saying we're going to do it we're, we're going to revisit it at a later date i think it's, it's kind of the plan here anybody else have any questions of carol or carol any other comments Justin, Andrew, anything? Other than, um, truthfully, they do put in a ton of time. I spent some time down there when they were there and the volunteers and hours and hours and hours in a kayak, which I can handle about a half an hour of mine. So I do appreciate uh, the work they put in to keep our resource the way it should be. I'll tell you, I can't spend three hours doing that next year. <laughs> Man, was I hurting. <laughs> All right. So I, I, 
If it's appropriate, I'll move to approve uh, IL-47. Okay, we have a motion by Keelan. I'll second. Second by Chestnut that we approve of IL. Can you leave that there for staff and others, please? Thank you. Make sure it's working. Uh, approve IL-47. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. I guess we're looking for a motion to adjourn then. Motion by Hackett, second by Peterson, that we adjourn this Inland Lakes District annual meeting until our next uh, meeting next August or subject to call. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. We're adjourned at uh, 6 21 p.m. Let's go right to the regular council meeting then, too. <clears throat> as soon as uh, Sandy's ready. And me. Okay, I call this uh, regular city council meeting to order. Today is Tuesday, August 21st, 2018. It is 6.22 p.m. Um, and uh, we will begin, as always, with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise and face the flag. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. <clears throat> and we'll ask Sandy to uh, read the open meeting statement for us. This meeting and all other meetings of the Common Council are open to the public. Proper notice has been posted and given to the press in accordance with Wisconsin state statutes, so the citizens may be aware of the time, place, and agenda of this meeting. And uh, also take roll for us, Sandy. Brian Smith. Here. Steve Hackett. Here. Lori Chestnut. Here. Paul Hagan, Alan Keeland, here. Scott Berchatsky, here. Dave Peterson, here. Paul Mayo, here. Chuck Whitman, here. Mary Fair, and Eric Olson. Seven present, we have a quorum. Uh, next on your agenda is the consent agenda. This is uh, items uh, that are put together on one big agenda uh, that uh, you can vote on with one motion. If there's any item that's within the consent agenda, council or staff, uh, that you would like to see moved to the regular agenda where you vote on that individually, this is the time to uh, let us know so that we can move it over to the regular agenda. Otherwise, I would be looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda as printed. Second. Motion by Peterson, second by Chestnut, that we approve of the consent agenda as printed. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Okay, under the regular agenda, Sandy, you had what, one handout? Yes, under number nine, new business letter E, award of bid, the regional detention basin documents were distributed. Okay, otherwise, uh, the regular agenda is all set up. Uh, any council member that uh, would like to see anything on the regular agenda changed around? Uh, otherwise, uh, again, I would be looking for a motion to approve the regular agenda as printed. So moved. Second. Motion by Keelan, second by Chestnut, that we approve of the re regular agenda uh, with that one additional handout. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Council members have to work a little harder. You're pretty short today, so. All right, uh, under uh, item number seven, this is non-agenda items. 
and announcements. We'll begin with a presentation by Beth Anderson on the Wapaka Municipal Airport uh, Brunner Field Annual Operations Report. And we have uh, uh, Beth, who is our airport manager. Beth, if you want to use that portable mic, if you can, would you please? Thank you. Justin. Okay, good evening. Thank you, Mayor and Council. There we go. <laughs> good evening. Thank you, Mayor and Council members. Um, it's been an eventful year at the airport. Uh, the 2016 asphalt project did come to a close early this year. Our new snow removal company, the Bellevue Farms, did a great job for the 2017 snow season. Brian did an excellent job with that April snowstorm we had. Wapaka was the one small airport that was open Monday afternoon after the snowstorm. Everybody else was pretty much closed down until at least So very proud to be able to get the foundry out that day by noon. So it was very exciting to have that happen. Um, my EAA chapter has hosted several events at the airport along with hosting their monthly meeting the second Saturday of every month at 10 a.m. They have gained 20 new members in the last year. So which is a total of 32 new members they've had since they moved to a pack in 2016. So far, the chapter this year had a really great chili cook-off early spring, which brought about 60 people to the airport. Um, they also had a Young Eagles event that had 120 people. They flew 47 children and actually about eight adults that day. They also had um, a group, three groups of uh, hot air balloons that decided to fly in that day, and they stayed around to do demonstrations for the children and the people at the airport. And it went off so well, they're planning on doing it in the future also. Um, we had a hamburger social earlier this spring where we had 70 people attending at that event. And they are the chapter is hosting their second hamburger social next week, Tuesday the 28th from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Anybody that wants to can attend. Donations are accepted. They are actually trying to get donations so they can build a hangar at the airport. So we're looking forward to having that happen. Um, they will also be offering Eagle and Young Eagles rides that day, of course, weather permitting. So anybody that wants an aircraft ride or airplane ride, they can do that. We are also planning on a land air scavenger hunt in the fall with the fall colors. So that way, if you fly, you can do it in an aircraft or we'll have it on the land where we would go using area businesses if they'd like to do that to be able to get people to know the area a little bit better. Other, evo other events at the airport this year include um, the Lions Club Father's Day Pancake, Pancake Breakfast. They had another great turnout this year, and I have spoken with them that we might be moving the pancake breakfast from the foundry hangar to the Bruner Snow Removal Hangar. So that'll be something to look forward to next year. We also had our second annual Caregivers Coalition Ageless Aviation Dream Flights for the veterans. That went very well. We had a few problems with uh, the burger hangar was tripping breakers with the, the food and everything that was going on. So I did have a private party that is paying for the electrical upgrade at the hangar because they don't want to see that problem happen again. So hopefully next year that'll be all set within the next few weeks. We'll get that done. I also had the area police departments host their evac training or the emergency vehicle operator training for the first time at the airport. They were at the airport for about three and a half days, and it went very well, and we're hoping to have them back next year. Um, I also had, during that time, the BOA had come to visit me, and they were very excited to see that the police department was there and mentioned that I should probably talk to the fire department, which I've been doing about getting them out for training at the airport also. Kind of helps both groups with costs, and it also helps me with let, having other people learn the airport in case there is ever an emergency at the airport that we need them there. The Cherokees Oshkosh were back for their ninth consecutive year. They increased their group from 22 aircraft to 29 aircraft. And thankfully, all 29 aircraft made their trip to Oshkosh for their mass takeoff, thanks to Richard yet again, fixing up the couple airplanes that had a few problems. We also had the Piper Cessna Flyer Group back in Wapaka this year for their training seminars. Their group is also continuing to grow. And they did their meet and greet at the airport this year and had Chapter 444 host that evening. They had such a good turnout and liked it so much that they already hired Chapter 444 to host them again next year. So we're looking forward to that. I had a few pilots using the aerobatic box again this year. We had the group from France with their Cree Cree come. Is the, they actually came to Wapaka and for the very first time in the United States flew with us at Wapaka and got their certifications to fly at Oshkosh. 
We also have the Yak 110 use the aerobatic box, and then Redline came back. They're the ones that do the night performance at the EAA. So they came to make sure everything was working properly before doing their, their job. So hopefully we'll see them all back again next year. Um, we had a slight increase in numbers of EAA due to the weather and the parking issues at Oshkosh. So we had about 181 passengers over 1,048 operations during the two weeks of EAA, including 451 piston aircrafts, 13 jets, 426 of them all being transit, along with selling over 5,500 gallons of fuel in those two weeks. Um, other things that are going on at the airport, early this spring I had a lightning strike that did damage to our PAPI system. We're working with the insurance company. It's finally getting um, taken care of just recently. Their electrician is almost done getting everything up and running completely. We've had parts that's an older PAPI system. So it takes a little while to find the parts to get them to get everything working. I've also had a problem with the increase of wildlife at the pop population at the airport. A um, few people know that back in 2016, I had a situation where I had 40 to 80 deers on my runways. Usually I have about 8 to 12, 8 to 15 is the average group of deer that we can usually manage safely. Uh, this year, about the second week in July, I was um, had about 30 to 50 cranes, up to 80 cranes hanging out with me for the last six weeks. So I've been out trying to chase them with the car and trying to figure out how to get rid of them. Well, they figured out if they go from one one runway that I chase them down that runway, they go to the other runway. And I do this back and forth for however long it takes to see if I can get them scared off far enough in the field that I can safely have airplanes take off and everything. So I've realized that it's not really working. So um, I'm looking to actually see if we can implement a hazard management plan for the airport. I did some research. I didn't see that we had anything officially implemented. It kind of makes it a little, my job a little bit harder because I have to document everything, but I think it is a step forward in the future for the airport because of the fact we're seeing more wildlife in the area. And of course, the population out by the airport is growing with the housing developments and everything else. The animals are gonna start continuing to move in, whether we have fencing or not. Um, so I'd like to try to get a hazard management plan. FAA has a great plan. It's a WHMP, or Wildlife Hazard Management Plan, that's already been used, researched, and implemented with the other air airports, not only around the United States, but in Wisconsin. So I think it would be a great idea to um, look into that or get the permission to do that. Therefore, it'll help me better be able to do my job better without having to keep on coming to council every time I have an issue. So, and um, other than that, it's been a really good year, and I guess we're going to be bringing this up later in the meeting on new business. So. Anybody have any questions of Beth? I know Paul Hagan. Yeah. Chairman, but uh, yeah. Two older men's that are airport board. <laughs> But uh, any questions? All right, Beth, thank you very much. You're going to hang around for the discussion on that? Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, next, uh, who's doing this? Henry, Brennan, the next one? The whiteboard? Yeah, I can, uh, I'm going to get Josh to help me with it. Uh, Many of you probably get the league's e-newsletter. Um, this uh, video is embedded in their last edition. Just a four-minute uh, video. Um, this is an issue that the league has been working hard on the last couple of years, and they've kind of come up with this education tool to try to uh, inform the public as well as elected officials of what, this, what the challenge is. Um, Fortunately, we haven't had to deal with this. Um, as one of the uh, titles on here, the Walgreens store was uh, actually within a development agreement. But if you remember, we closed those out. And in that development agreement, there was a, a clause in there that they couldn't contest their assessment, that kind of thing. So I guess it's just informational, no action, just wanted to have you see it? I think it's really well done. Uh, it explains a really complex 
topic. I think is good. I don't know, Kathy, you probably deal with it in, in your association and those kind of things. If there are big box or other chain retailers in your community, your property taxes may be going up. That's because certain commercial properties have been able to obtain special tax reductions. Perhaps you've heard of these tax breaks. They're known as the dark store and Walgreens loopholes. Unless the state legislature closes these loopholes, other property owners, including homeowners, will pay an average of 8% more in property taxes. Even more in some communities. Communities like the town of Grand Chute, Ashwaubenon, Sheboygan, West Bend, Franklin, Pleasant Prairie, Sun Prairie, La Crosse, and Rice Lake. You see, the total amount of property taxes a local government may collect is strictly limited by state law. The size of the property tax pie stays pretty much the same from one year to the next. What can and does change is how the pie gets divided. When one kind of property, like big box stores, pays less, other kinds, like residential and mom-and-pop businesses, pay more. Let's take a closer look at the dark store loophole. Attorneys for big box chains claim that a brand new store in a busy area has the same value for tax purposes as a vacant, boarded-up dark property located in an unpopular location. Here's an actual example. A low store in Wauwatosa is assessed for taxes at $13.6 million. Lowe's claims it's only worth $7.1 million, yet Lowe's spent in excess of $16 million to acquire the land and build the structure. Lowe's argues that even the land was devalued from $9 million to $3 million once the big box store was constructed. And Lowe's insists its store can only be compared to vacant dark stores for property tax purposes. Ironically, as big box stores fight for a smaller share of property taxes, they use more municipal services. Big box stores demand more police, fire, and ambulance service than other commercial properties, and way more than residential properties. Every day, municipal police, fire, and ambulance respond to calls from big box stores. Meanwhile, the cost of paying for these services gets shifted to homeowners, the class of property using these services the least. The other loophole is called Walgreens after a 2008 Wisconsin Supreme Court decision. That ruling allows national pharmacies and other businesses who lease their store to claim the value of their properties, for tax purposes, is less than half of the actual sale price. Here's another real example. Walgreens challenged the city of Oshkosh's assessment of its store. The Court of Appeals, relying on the 2008 decision, decided that the value of the Walgreens property was $2.2 million, much less than the $4.3 million actual 2009 sale price of the property. Other taxpayers, mainly homeowners, now have to cover Walgreens' former share of the taxes. Plus, Oshkosh taxpayers had to pay the corporation a tax refund of $69,500. Nearly 300 pharmacies in Wisconsin can take advantage of this loophole, including stores in Ashland, Onalaska, Dodgeville, Beaver Dam, Weston, Appleton, and Sturgeon Bay, and in your neighborhood. Other commercial and manufacturing businesses that lease their space are also beginning to use this same loophole. Only the Wisconsin State Legislature can stop this unfair tax shift. Tell your state legislators to restore fairness and common sense to the property tax system by closing the dark store and Walgreens loopholes. Call your state legislator through the legislative hotline at 1-800-362-9472 or visit darkstoreloopholes.org. And I tell you, I got to get one of those magic markers. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, thanks, Henry, for bringing that up because it's important that uh, 
But we really don't have any vacant uh, big box stores, but uh, interesting, the concept. So appreciate that. Any questions or comments from council or staff on that? Okay, in your packet, there is a thank you note from the Wapak Area Chamber of Commerce for the uh, contribution that the city had made to the 4th of July display. And they just wanted to thank us. That's just in there for uh, informational purposes only. But we can move on then to uh, 7B, which is public input. Uh, and this is your opportunity. Uh, to speak on a non-agenda item. So if there's anybody in the audience or staff or council members that would like to speak on a non-agenda item, please step up to the podium, give your name and address for the record, and please limit your discussion to three minutes or less. And would you please use that portable mic too when you're up there? Hello. My name is Barbara Trolls, and in mid-March, we purchased our home at 703 Demarest on the corner of 7th and Demarest. This home was previously owned by Betty Anderson, whose husband was an attorney in town, and their daughter, Kay Anderson, practices law here. Shortly after we moved in, we realized we had a group home for developmentally disabled women at 921 7th Avenue, which borders the north side of our property. The presence of this group home being run as a business was not disclosed before we purchased our house. Having worked in the field of special education for 45 years and been the assistant director of the second largest special education cooperative in Illinois, which is similar to your CSAs, I'm familiar with group homes. In Illinois, in order to run a group home, it must be approved by the city and hearings and notifications must be held before approval. My neighbors inform me that this didn't happen. This is also, there is also a group home run by the same agency on Clark Street around the block from us. Our purpose of attending this meeting today is to voice our concerns over the sale of the property on the other side of our home, on the east side at 709 Demarest. We were informed by the realtor, Faye Wilson, that the property would be closing tomorrow, 822. We were told this on Saturday and was sold to a company out of Milwaukee called Bravco. When we asked if a family would be moving in, she said no, it was not going to be occupied by a family. We commented that we already had two group homes in a one block radius for the developmentally disabled. And she said she needed to be careful what she said, but it would not be for that type of population. After talking to Jessica Crystal in your office in the zoning department, who was very helpful, it seems there's no requirement for group homes for the developmentally disabled population to inform anyone when they move in. We are not complaining about the group homes presently in place and are trying to be good neighbors to them and their vulnerable population. We do have grave concerns over what type of clients or population is expecting to move into the house next to us on Demarest. Could they be convicted? sexual offenders or other convicted felons? Could it be turned into a rehab facility for drug and alcohol abuse? Or could it be some other type of halfway house? This is a family neighborhood with a mix of young and old, seniors and young children. The Methodist Church is across the street and has told us that they plan to run an after-school program one day a week, which is directly across from this home where they have a neighborhood playground open to all. How do we find out what this property is going to be used for? We are concerned for the safety and well-being of, of everyone in the neighborhood and the value of our property. We are directly impacted by this property as its windows overlook our side yard where we have our patio grill and furniture where we eat and entertain our grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Brennan, this was in your office. I don't know if you had the discussion or not, um, do we, I mean, I don't even know how to ask, ask this question or anything, but I mean, do we have any control over any of those things? Uh, <clears throat> Can we have control over any of those things if we wanted to? 
There are strict uh, state requirements that are actually different than Illinois. Um, depending on the type of home that it is, a lot of them are controlled by the state, managed by the state, and the municipalities do not have any regulations on where they can be placed depending on how many beds are actually within the facility. Um, I don't have the um, in front of me this evening, but over a certain threshold uh, for uh, bedroom or bed facilities, there are some instances when the city can get involved and identify it would be some form of a special use permit where they could be located. But a lot of these facilities uh, are typically eight beds or less are uh, organized and run by the state and the city does not have any control over them at all. Thank you, uh, sir. Yeah, my name is John Merrick and Barbara Trolls is my wife and we own the house together. And I guess we're concerned about the fact that we purchased a property in town here and not the first property I've owned in this town. Um, and we have a group home on one side and from what we're understanding at this point in talking to some people in town that this is going to be a drug and alcohol rehabilitation situation. Um, and I'm not 100% positive of that but that is what I'm getting the drift of. And the impact that that has on one house along with the neighborhood, but having group homes on each side of us and the two group homes actually connect on property line where you have handicapped young ladies living and you're going to have drug and alcohol people in the same on the property that borders up to their corner of their property. And you can see the other women's home that's on Clark Street directly behind this home. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm concerned about it. And I guess, what does it do to my property values? And what rights do we have as individuals? Thank you. I, I can uh, tell you that uh, when we have public in input, uh, the idea is is to find out what's going on that we don't uh, realize might be happening in our community. And, and we appreciate you coming forward with this. And I can promise you that from staff level, we will discuss this and uh, we'll get back to council if anything there that there is that can be done and, and just so again I, this is the first I've heard of this so I I, I mean I, I think we need enough time to do our, our own research to find out what's going on I, I'm very sympathetic to you quite honestly I have a, a daughter with three grandchildren that live very close to you too quite honestly so you know I mean uh, just I say one more thing uh, this puts us in a position where we have our grandchildren there and my daughter and son-in-law and live in Illinois and my daughter's a teacher and my son-in-law is in the law enforcement business and was involved with the FBI in the sexual crimes division. And if we have this kind of stuff next to us, I have a feeling he's going to try to keep my grandchildren from ever being able to come to my house. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I, again, I, I, don't, I don't really have any answers for you tonight, but I do promise you that we will discuss this. We will get back to you. Did we get their personal information, you know, or can I, we get their personal information? I know that, the, that someone did speak with Rhonda last week when I was out of the office. Um, but I will certainly get back to him. I can tell you that our office, this, this issue has come up time and time again, not only since I've been employed here, but where I was previously, um, it is definitely a, a delicate situation. And unfortunately there's also a significant amount of rules depending on the size of a facility, how many beds the type of facility is as well. So we do have a good amount of research on it thus far, and I'd be happy to 
once we could compile all that, bring it back to the council so it could be publicly addressed. Well, let's, yeah, let's let's get together, uh, Henry, Brennan, myself, and council member that would like to, to uh, come up with a plan or a thought. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to know. Can you give your? Name? My name is Linda Real, and I live on Seventh Street. Um, like a resident, how can they just move in like this without us as neighbors knowing what's moving in? If you guys don't know what's going on, how, you know, I got a grandson too that comes over and I don't want this in our neighborhood. We've already had two drug busts in our neighborhood and now we're moving in alcoholic and drug addicts that are going to be affecting these these ladies in these group homes that are on drugs, medications, and what is this house going to be staffed 24-7? Can, you know, I've got a lot of questions, and I'd like to know as the residents of the city and this neighborhood to be notified of this before the house gets sold and the stuff gets moved in. How can it just get moved in without us being notified? That's my question. Uh I, I, again, if it falls within guidelines within the state statutes, this no municipality in Wisconsin, I can honestly tell you, knows about these types of homes before they go into the into the neighborhoods. If it, if, it, if it meets the guidelines and it, it does not require a special use permit from a municipality, whether it's the city of Wapak or any other organization, they are not required to notify neighborhoods or anything else. Like the two group homes that moved in without any of us notifying, being notified of that either. That is correct. Again, if they meet the state statutes, they are not required to notify anybody. And these residents have been leaving the premises and walking away. And the workers that are there are trying to get them to come back. I guess me as in a resident that lives there, I guess I'll just have to keep calling the police to rescue these people or to, to get them back into their place. I guess that's all I have to do. I'm done. Well, I, I, again, I, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry that uh, that this is affecting you, and, and but I don't really think we're going to get any answers tonight. And like I said, uh, as a staff level, we will discuss this and any council, as I said, any council would like to be a part of that you certainly can once we set up a time to meet with that and we will certainly get back to you Linda and Keith if you uh yeah somebody have a sheet of paper or else if you can remember uh B Smith at city of org, you can send an email with your contact information to that address Any other public input for tonight? <clears throat> Any other public input? I do wanna, as, as always, I, uh, and this is sports related obviously tonight, uh, we have, uh, we had a uh, big softball tournament over the weekend and I understand that the trophy is not sitting on Washington Street, but it's actually on uh, Washington Street. Oh, it is on Washington. Okay. Oh, it yeah, is. A, both had the same oh, point. you're both on Washington. But the fire department did beat the police officers on Saturday. One was had by all. We like to thank everyone that supported us. Peterson Dodge did an excellent job of coordinating it, getting everything together. And we do have a trophy. It is a traveling trophy, and hopefully, we'll win it back again next year. Just. <laughs> yeah, I also want to congratulate uh, Wapaka Lakeman. Lakeman. Of course, we know Dave Peterson is the head coach or the manager, I guess we call it, uh, in baseball. And uh, the Lakeman uh, beat Scandinavia 9-1 to on Sunday. And so they're moving on. Uh, if they win the next game against Clintonville next Sunday at 1.30 at Clintonville, then they would play for the grand championship the following week. So we wish them good luck. Um, 
Anybody else have any other information community wise? All right, uh, let's move on then. We have uh, department head reports, and uh, we usually always do this during the second meeting of the month. And uh, as always, we'll start on my left, and we'll have Kathy. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council Members. My report starts on page 10 of the packet. Um, we are starting to get in some of the information for the 2019 budget from the state of Wisconsin Department of Revenue. Um, it's not good news, but... Um, our net new construction was only 1.9 million, uh, which equates to 0.46%. Uh, this only allows our tax levy to increase by $10,751. Um, this year, we also have the termination of TIF number seven on Ware Street. Um, that brought back 3.4 million onto the tax roll and allows us to adjust our tax levy uh, with a calculation of another $11,452. So our um, total tax levy can only go up legally this year by $22,203 or 0.63%. And that is for our operating portion of our tax levy. Um, our debt levy uh, gets adjusted based on the amount of debt that uh, payments that we have each year. So that fluctuates every year, but this is uh, controlled by the um, levy limit law. And so we can see only about 22,000, which isn't very much. And so we'll be asking departments again to be very creative with the um, small amount of money that we have. Uh, last week, Thursday, I was in Madison attending the Board of Commissioners of Public Lands uh, Study Committee meeting on the investment and use of state's trust school state trust funds. Um, this is uh, a program that we utilize a lot. It's the state trust fund loan program that municipalities and school districts use um, to pay for uh, capital projects and um, economic development and equipment. Uh, the League of Wisconsin Municipalities had uh, Mr. Robert Scott, who is the finance director from the city of Brookfield, um, invited to speak to the committee on how the municipalities use this program because they are looking at doing away with it um, and not giving us that, op that loan option um, for borrowing. They're um, based on the discussion at the committee, they're looking that um, they're looking for municipalities to use their local banks instead. And they would like to use the money that they have to invest in the stock market to be to have a better, um, a larger pot of money to give back to the school districts, um, which is who is supposed to be getting this money. Um, so we'll be watching to see uh, what this committee continues to do uh, going forward, and hopefully that um, they'll continue to have the state trust fund loan because that gives us the ability to um, borrow at a lower rate and a lower cost and um, be able to do the kind of capital projects that we need to, to do for our, our municipality because of the um, levy limits that we're under. So, um, but otherwise, that's all I have. Thanks, Kathy. Any questions for Kathy? Peg. Thanks, Paul. Um, so uh, the library has new bubblers, and if you're not from Wisconsin, that's a drinking fountain. And these drinking fountains actually have a bottle fill on them. Um, Public Works helped us coordinate, get those put in, and the Library Foundation paid for them. So take a visit, fill your bottle, save a, save a little bit of uh, the environment that way. We have an outdoor movie. We're cooperating with the Park and Recs department um, this Friday night. It's Coco, one of my favorites, so I hope you'll join us. It's going to start at dusk on Friday, August 24th in Swan Park. Um, we have an escape room that we're planning for adults, so if you're interested in, in that whole idea of a breakout room, um, we've got some places left on that. That is August 31st at 6 p.m. Just call and make reservations. Should be a lot of fun. It's all free of charge. We have beginner computer classes for those people who just feel like they need to brush up on those skills starting at 10 a.m. on Wednesdays in September. 
Um, there is a registration required. We just need to know how many to plan for. Our tablet time continues on Thursdays at 10. Um, this is an opportunity for you to bring in your smartphone or your tablet, something that you have questions about or need help with, and there's staff there that can help you with that. Our classic movies start again in September with Dr. Jack Rhodes. Um, our first one is Three Little Words, and it is the first Thursday in September, so it's always the first Thursday of the month. Um, and also we have Sensory Saturdays, and this is um, Saturdays that are put aside for a very special experience for people who are on the spectrum, autism spectrum, and we have that on the second Saturday. So Sensory Saturdays on the second Saturday of the month. Um, and then Tuesday nights is our teen night for um, playing card games, and they're going to have Yu-Gi-Oh! and Magic the Gathering every Tuesday night in our teen room. We also have a new teen librarian, and I hope that you'll stop in and say hello to Taylor Wilcox. She was our teen intern, and we hired her for the position, and she's just recently started. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Brennan? Thank you, Mayor. Members of Council, my report starts on page 62. Um, just kind of give a high-level update. Uh, we're going to definitely start seeing more dirt flying around here, other than our construction project around City Hall and Library Square. Permits have been issued for Dollar General and for the 48-unit apartment uh, projects. Those will be... Uh, undertaken here shortly um, this evening there's two items on the agenda for consideration which would be the award of bid for the stormwater regional detention basin out near the east gateway um, area along with the uh, offer to purchase for the go right uh, bus company for a bus terminal within the industrial park so we'll definitely be seeing some more construction yet coming this year and just want to highlight um, for the past six days uh, a bunch of us have been um, we were fortunate uh, our consultant team from Dallas, Texas was in town uh, for our branding and wayfinding study. And I just want to say a sincere thank you to uh, Terry and Mary Fair for opening up their homes uh, for meals. Uh, this was the first time that the consultants have ever had a, actually a home-cooked meal coming into a community. And just in general, all the different businesses that participated and helped us out through the week and a lot of the different interviews that uh, happened um, the, the consultant team felt very welcome and I appreciate all um, everyone that was that participated over the last six days and uh, invite not only staff but also the council off the city website. They do have, uh, as of yesterday, did launch the We Are Ropaca uh, website and that'll be kind of the host website that will detail uh, their trips and work as they continue through. There's a sign up on there for continued updates, so please sign on to that as well within about a week to a week and a half. There will be a recap video of their first trip up here as well and with all the different business owners and uh, individuals that they that they met so i uh keep an outlook or outlook for that uh moving forward awesome thank you brennan justin thank you mayor uh <clears throat> my packet or my Date can be seen on page 64 and 65 of the packet. Excuse me for that. Uh, and as usual, starting at the wastewater side, we are working on uh, renewing our permit. So by the end of the year, our permit at the treatment plant will be expired. And as usual, we'll have to go through the process of renewing, which we are doing, uh, submitting our effluent samples and getting uh, evaluation of that uh, now. Uh, the rumor and what is the workings with the DNR and EPA uh, is a future pending ultra-low phosphorus concentration limit, um, which bad news is if, if it hits us, we will have expensive improvements. Uh, good news is we will have time uh, to make those improvements. So the permits, they're not just heavy-handed and saying do this and do this now. They work with you. It takes time. So um, <clears throat> inner circles with other municipalities have seen this come their way already and have been given upwards of five to seven years to um, study it, review it, make those improvements to try and get to the new um, concentration level that they're looking for. Uh, street side, I got quite a few updates on that. Uh, the signals, the pilot the study that we're doing with the flashing uh, will return back to normal uh, come after Labor Day, so September 4th. Uh, the signals will go back to normal. So please be careful when you travel back down through uh, downtown at that time. Uh, the four-way stops will go away, and we'll be gathering all that data that we uh, received during the pilot study and coming back to council with our findings. Uh, and shortly after that, there will be a public meeting uh, regarding the Main Street, and we'll try and tie all that sort of information all together because obviously the reason why we're doing this pilot study to see if we need signals 
uh, when we reconstruct Main Street in the future. Uh, City Hall Square is in full swing, and as you can see, and even here right now in feel, uh, they're out there working hard uh, right now. So they are still on schedule. We still are getting great weather, uh, and we're looking to get this thing uh, wrapped up by the end of next month. So keep your fingers crossed for, for good weather. Evans Street, that contract has been processed with Gremmer and Associates for the design of Gremmer, or uh, for the design of Evans Street, excuse me, and they are currently reviewing uh, survey data, right-of-way data, uh, survey maps, all those sort of things, and we are planning a meeting uh, early in September to walk the job and start coming up with some early uh, proposals and answers for Evans Street, so more to come on that. Uh, the DOT is planning a signal uh, improvement project on the off-ramps of U.S. Highway 10, uh, the westbound off-ramp, so Kitty Corner to Burger King there. Uh, that intersection there will be uh, improved to a signalized intersection. The other ramp uh, over by, uh, say, the Strip Mall or Best Western there will not have signals. Uh, but regardless, that work will start after Labor Day as well. Uh, an update I just received was the e-bridge. Uh, that should be open early to mid-September as well. So shortly after Labor Day, that will open up. Um, so all these road projects should be uh, opening up shortly after Labor Day and into September. Uh, and finally, something that's not in the packet is we did receive funding uh, from the Wisconsin Disaster Fund from our June uh, 2017 storm. So it, it took a while, but we finally got... <laughs> Uh, the money back for all of our overtime spent and all the extra services uh, that we allocated to clean up from that disaster. <clears throat> Moving on to water, we are in the process of our well three rehab. Uh, it's taking a little bit longer than usual, ran into a, a couple uh, minor issues, but we're working on that and uh, we should still have that wrapped up before the end of the year. Um, and on the facility side, Russ did submit the Public Service Commission uh, energy grant application. Uh, what that would do would uh, pay for a study to basically study some of our energy saving uh, projects, uh, such as a boiler replacement, our roof replacement, some of the bigger uh, capital funds that we have. Uh, this study would be paid for, basically telling us what would be the payback. Is it worth our while, uh, dollars and cents wise, to do these projects? So uh, cross your fingers that we get that. And I always always like to give a heads up that we will be doing our uh, dead, dying, and disease tree review uh, shortly within the next month. So uh, as usual, we'll drive around and look for these, uh, I guess, trees with issues that pose a risk to other human life and trees as well, and try to send notifications to get those cleaned up. So that about wraps it up for me, Mayor. All right. Thank you, Justin. Can I ask a question? You can. Um, the Evans Street project, uh, you're going to be having some meeting with the residents, I hope? Yes, we're planning another public information meeting, but probably, oh, it might be like this winter yet. We haven't have it, we don't have it scheduled uh, or planned yet, but we we will have one. I've got several calls. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ryan. As long as you're asking about Evan Street too, <clears throat> you had some numbers and maybe you're going to say that later. Okay, so he's going to talk a little bit about Evan Street also. I'm familiar with that. I had to sit through it. No, we're not no, skipping you, Andrew. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to get that off that easy. <laughs> All right, thank you, Justin. Andrew, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Council members. Actually, I'm not getting off the hook, uh, or I am getting off the hook because the first thing I'm going to do tonight is. Um, introduce our new recreation program supervisor who is sitting behind me somewhere here. Her name is Cassandra Humke, and I will let her introduce herself and explain all the programs we're doing here. Um, yeah, I'm Cassandra Humke. I'm from Greenwood, Wisconsin. It's about an hour and a half northwest of here. Um, I grew up there. I went to school at UW La Crosse, just graduated in May with a uh, degree in recreation management. Um, all of my experience has been in municipalities, City of Greenwood, City of Eau Claire, City of Marshfield, and then Clark County, also Clark of Forestry. Uh, I'm excited to be here in Wapaka, be part of the community, and I really can't wait to just um, contribute to the community. I'm, I really, I do love being a part of the community, so just like uh, contributing to the 
greater good of everyone. Yeah. Any questions? I know. Welcome. Their community. I'm sure nobody's happier than Andrew is, quite honestly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's been good to make a note every day of all the things that I want her to do instead of having it on my And then they both list, leave so. me at lunch and I'm there by myself to answer the phone. <laughs> so. yeah. There you go. Well, welcome. Thank you. So uh, Cassandra did went out um, through the whole process, um, the interview. Um, she just did an amazing job, and I wish Eric was here to talk about that as well um, a little bit. So um, very genuine. I, I, I'm glad to have her on board, and the way she communicates with people is exactly how we should be doing things here in the, in the community. So um, I look forward to her getting into everything and getting through that first year to try to kind of take over everything. And and um, she's already got some great ideas for our Halloween party to make it better. And that's what we need, so, uh, some good new ideas to bring in and, and make things better for our community. So um, we'll update you on how things are going with that. Um, other than that, as far as recreation, we're, we're kind of in a transition period where soccer is ending. Um, we have youth volleyball, kids chess, youth flag football, adult volleyball, adult pickleball starting very soon. So Cassandra will be very busy very quickly. Um, uh, Swan Park has been rolling like every other weekend. Um, we did have the Battle of the Badges. If you don't remember, the fire department won against the uh, police department. In case Can you I forgot, ask right? score that? Mr. Whitman? I think I actually got it wrong. So I don't know. We had like 20 something and they had like 10 or 13 or something. A lot to a little. <laughs> um, this weekend we have the Washera Classic. Oh, yeah, they can arrest you. <laughs> <laughs> they tried to during One the game and it didn't work so well for them. Oh. So. <laughs> Um, we have the Washera Classic this weekend. It's an outside organization that comes in and uses the park. We also have our movie in the park um, that we talked about or Peg talked about a little bit. So um, as always, that park will be heavily used and, and rolling through that um, in that park. And it was used last Saturday. We did get up the um, bleacher covers that the um, baseball organization um, donated the money for. Uh, I can tell you it was a, a huge team effort by a lot of different people um, to get those up. Uh, including Josh and Casey, um, some Roger was out there, some, and uh, WPS came out and volunteered some time and manpower. Um, the foundry was involved a little bit, so it was definitely a team effort and and some really hard work to get those up. Um, we are very appreciative of all that work and effort. We are going to put up a few plaques on those, um, recognizing the baseball board, WPS, and and some of the work that went into those, um, so people realize uh, how much effort was put into that. Um, so those are up and uh, good to go. Uh, as far as the senior center is going, uh, they brought in some people to work on the mural. I know I've talked about that before, and it really looks really good. It's not completely done, but if you get a chance to walk through there or take a look, make sure you take a look because it's really coming along and uh, is really, really a neat touch down there. And, and the good thing is, you know, the seniors have really taken ownership of that uh, area and making it what what they want and that's really neat to see um there's a lot of volunteers now coming up to work on that and coming out of the woodwork and and that's really a good thing for the senior center as they move forward they also uh, use those volunteers heavily for a lot of their fundraisers they just had their rummage sale um and they made about nineteen hundred dollars off of that and they're going to have an auction coming <coughs> up in september and a lot of that happens because of the volunteers and the and um, the seniors starting to take some ownership down there, and that's that's a really good thing. And I think Sarah has kind of brought that uh, out of those people and kind of led that. So Sarah's doing a great job down there as well. And uh, that is it, unless there's any question. Thank you, Andrew. Chief. Thank you, Mayor. My report can be found on page 39. Um, Earlier, we've been talking about Berlin Street, and each meeting I talk about a speed report. We've continued to keep the speed board over on Evans Street, and from the time frame of July 29th through August 7th, we had, for going westbound, 1,041.7 vehicles per day is going down that road just in the westbound. Of that westbound, the average speed of the vehicles was 25.78, and 85% 85, 85 of the vehicles being at 29.13 miles per hour. There were um, a few vehicles that went 49.50 miles per hour 
um, down at road during those time frames, we are running radar and we are stopping offenders in that area. Um, unknown if that could have been an emergency vehicle responding to a scene or what it may be, but we are running radar in those in those areas. And the highest traffic volume seems to be in between 11 and 5 o'clock. So we're hitting those time frames as to when we're there to try to keep everybody slowing down because we realize how much volume of traffic is going down that road. Um, we also, last week, if anybody drove by the middle school, they may, may have seen about 20 to 30 um, squad cars parked outside the middle school. We've been working with the schools and the SWAT team and all the local police departments and sheriff's departments in the area in regards to active shooter training. Um, so that was put on by the Wapak County SWAT team. And almost every member of each department participated in this training, whether it was in Wapaka, New London, or Clintonville. And there's new techniques that are being used for law enforcement in regards to if something bad, tragedy were to happen, as to how we have to respond in the school. So we worked with the SWAT team and on those skills that we needed for um, the inside, and it was excellent training. So that is something that we're going to continue to do on a yearly basis. So next year, we'll probably pick a different school. We may go to the learning center or we may go to the high school. So it's something that we're going to continue to train for. Um, we also had our second annual brat fry at Fleet Farm over the weekend. Um, we were able to get some donations from Piggly Wiggly and Moe's Hot Dogs. And um, we had a great event out there. We got set up about 8 o'clock in the morning and went until 2 o'clock. And we just about sold out of everything. Um, and that money that we received from that day, um, one of the things that we learned during active shooter training is a lot of times um, we don't have our tactical gear on that, um, that we don't normally wear it. We just have our bulletproof vests on when we go into a call. And one of the things we realize is the officers don't have tourniquets with them. They're on their um, they're on their bags as to when we respond with our tactical gear. So the officers are going to start carrying tourniquets on them. Um, also, that money is going to be utilized for our community events that we do. We serve food at the bread basket, and we we do that twice a year. So the money that was raised, we're going to put back into the community. Um, then after our long day of being at the Brat Fry, we were a little tired and we had to participate in the softball game. <laughs> That's like the fourth excuse you've made up. So I, I would like to congratulate the fire department um, in regards to their win. We didn't realize that they were having organized practices before this event, so evidently they must have uh, felt a little intimidated that they're going to be playing a bunch of 40-year-old guys and girls. So... They had some organized practices. So we're actually going to start practicing this year for a rematch for next year. And hopefully can, that trophy comes back. I can just imagine who your new hire is now, too, just based <laughs> on this. <laughs> we will be recruiting. <laughs> so, um, and I guess in closing, um, Dan Wazerud, we, we hired him three years ago. It doesn't seem like he's been here that long. He's just been a a great asset to our department and to the community. So I'm happy that we have him and um, continue to go forward in the future with him. Everything else that I have um, is informational. All right. Thank you, Chief. Any questions for the Chief? Josh Warner. Um, we had some issues with our phone system about a month ago, and next year we're slated to replace it, so we're just bumping up the process, and we're getting going on that now with anticipation of replacing it over this winter. Um, the WAPAC Online Project, we've got about 25 new customers to the north, seven pops. We've got another one we're adding, and then we've got a rather large business-type client that uh, just gave us confirmation today they'd like to sign up, um, so that's exciting. Um, and you're on the meeting tonight, you're going to see a request to upgrade our spectrum bandwidth. We're about to the point that we're maxing out on that. And then uh, last week, we taped a pretty neat episode of our WAPACA local live TV program at Watopia that uh, turned out really 
nice. We had Alex Wilson as the featured artist. Thanks, Josh. Done. Man of many words. Uh, let's move on to Henry. Uh, my report's on page 69. I guess a couple quick announcements. Uh, we did have our uh, summer primary. Um, I don't know if you have the statistics you'd like to share with everyone. I do. We had 954 voters, which was 33%. Oh, wow. What do you know the statewide participation? I do not, but they were um, predicting around 20%. Yeah. Good. And again, you know, it's uh, it's great that we have the volunteers that we have. We uh, uh, staff does a good job, and our election inspectors are always always Johnny on the spot. Um, the other thing is our next budget workshop is at our next council meeting after our next council meeting on uh, September fourth, I believe it is uh, Tuesday, September fourth, and the topic will uh, be personnel. And then finally, um, in, the, it, in the information here, it says the 14th. Well, thank you. It is the 4th. Yes, sorry. Thank you for correcting that, Steve. And then finally, uh, as you know, this week was a very busy week, and I guess I'd like to extend a thank you to a couple of our departments, uh, Park and Rec Department, and the Department of Public Works, and, and two key uh, people in those departments was Josh uh, Peterson in Parks and uh, Roger Hansen in the Street Division. Um, these events uh, really tax our resources, and, and they all did a great job, and they were pleasant and very gracious. Um, we had a curveball on the triathlon thrown at us at about uh, 9 a.m. Friday morning uh, when uh, the county started chip sealing <laughs> Crystal Lake Road, which was on our long course bike route. And, uh, so we had to adjust, and and uh, and it all worked out well, and, and we had to work with the town of Dayton to kind of come up with some an alternative route. So, again, if, very busy weekend, uh, uh, lots going on, and wanted to thank those departments and those individuals specifically. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. Any questions, comments from <clears throat> Henry? All right, let's uh, move on to unfinished business. Uh, this is actually the uh, holdover of uh, last meeting. It's the ordinance, uh, second reading of the ordinance 11-18. Uh, this is uh, ordinance placing permanent classification on lands uh, annexed into the city of Opaca, and uh, this is the second reading. Brennan, any additional comments on that? Okay. So we'd be looking for a motion to approve. Motion by Whitman. Second. Second by Keelan that we approve of the ordinance number 1118. Any discussion? Sandy will call the roll. Dave Peterson. Aye. Paul Mayo. Aye. Chuck Whitman. Aye. Lori Chestnut. Aye. Alan Keeland. Aye. Steve Hackett. Aye. And Scott Prochatsky. Aye. Seven ayes. Motion carried. All right. Uh, on to new business. We have a license report uh, number 1416. And this has to do with... Uh, I guess there's just one on there. It's a Class B. Uh, sorry, let me help. A Class B fermented malt beverage uh, license for 3H Brew Company, also known as, or doing business as HH Hinder Brewing Company. Henry, yeah, I can I could set this up and probably tag team it with uh, Brennan. Mike Strike is here, who's the owner's representative. If you wanted to ask him any questions. Um, we can't wait for your establishment to open, um, and this is part of uh, his uh, uh, doing so. This uh, license would allow him um, to sell uh, uh, beer, and uh, he is actually wanting to sell wine, but because he's a brewery, he's prohibited from doing so. But this license will allow him to uh, sell other types of beer, and the staff has been in uh, some discussions, and, and, I, and this is not for action tonight, 
but we have one reserve class B license available, and that is the $10,000 license. If you remember, Council, we talked about that a few years ago. Uh, back at that time, we were discussing maybe a cash grant back to the individual that that license would be issued to. You made a decision that you would consider that after he paid the $10,000, he never pulled the trigger on it. We still have the license, but the ability to um, rebate or somehow provide an incentive to the owner of that, li or to the licensee, we can't do that anymore. So it's a flat $10,000 fee, and it's for one, one time. And then the renewal is the typical license fee. Um, ultimately, um, I'm not sure Mike can really go into a lot of details. He would like to have council considering issuing him that license. Um, but we have, I think, some more work uh, to do. But this uh, would allow him to sell the beer. And then uh, on the wine part of it, I don't think you'll be ready for that by the time you open. But I think we can work that uh, through with some kind of memorandum of understanding on how that license will be used. Um, because there's some nuances that I don't know, Brendan, you want to go into that a little bit, or maybe you don't want to confuse everybody, but that's a one super ordinary license that we've had, uh, f ever since they changed the licensing rules, uh, back in the late 1990s. I believe. Henry, and that, that's a full liquor license, isn't it? Yes. So if he wants to sell beer and wine, why can't he have a beer and wine? No, license? he can't sell wine because he's a brewery. Uh, Central Water Sales. No, that is bef because they are grandfathered in. There's a lot of backstory to this. I think we should focus on the, this license this evening. I've looked into it, but it's not on the agenda, so I don't think we should probably be going down that road. The license that's on here for this evening is for, for Mike to be able to sell beer that's not brewed at his location. So if he has guest tap lines or anything else, he's required to have a Class B liquor license. That's what's on the application for this evening. However, we are looking at options for him to sell other um, alcoholic beverages. He is looking to purchase the building next door to him, which will, which will be vacated by the school district after next year with Go Right Way. Um, so that is going to be closing here shortly. He's looking to add to the opportunity that he has on that site, which would require a full liquor license in the future. Yeah, I think we just wanted to make you aware. So, uh, he's requesting, I'll go back, uh, a Class B fermented malt beverage license. And uh, that's in the form of license report 1416. So, we, if you're okay with that, we would need a motion to approve. Second. Hackett, second by Chestnut, that we approve of license report number 1416. Discussion? So this isn't that high price. No, no. This is just a beer, just, just a beer license, so that okay. I think Brennan explained this. Yep. But yeah, I mean, if it's since he wants, he's going to sell other beer besides his own. He needs this license, right? There's no quota for these types of licenses. All right. Okay. Understood. <laughs> Any other questions? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 <clears throat> Against. Motion carried. Mike, again, good luck to you. All right, uh, next we have, uh, Beth alluded to this in her uh, talk about the airport. Uh, this is has to do uh, with uh, wildlife management at the Wapaka Municipal Airport, Brunner Field. Uh, I met with, uh, Henry and I actually met with Beth uh, last uh, Thursday morning, and uh, she does have an issue with uh, Sandhill cranes out at the airport and has had issues, obviously, with deer out there, too. Uh, so basically what uh, she's asking or, or what we're asking for safety reasons, or any other reasons around the airport that uh, we, that uh, something get put in place to try and alleviate these issues that are that are out there. I think you can see on uh, in her her memo uh, I don't what page is that on? I'm sorry. Uh, 117. Yeah. 117 her memo is on? Okay. Oh, 
137, her memo is on page 137. Um, and then there was also an email that I don't think you received. Did council members receive that? No, I, this was something that didn't get in the packet, but it's um, I've, the representative now, Mike Gabor, with the BOA is no longer with. He's retired, but it's a new gentleman that uh, Beth deals with. Basically saying it's it's a, a very common practice uh, to have these uh, plans, and you know they they call them pyro, but they're basically like uh, air guns, bird banger, the scream or the whistlers. These names are referred to actual cartridges being shot. The gun itself is a starter pistol like that used in track and field, and then he supplied some videos of the use. Um, so I guess it's a fairly common practice across uh, Wisconsin to use these devices. I did speak very briefly with uh, with John Hart. Again, as uh, you know, we we don't allow discharge of a firearm, but these are maybe not classified as firearms. But I think what uh, Beth is ultimately asking for, and I think before too much work was done on it, was just see if there was consensus to move forward to actually bring a written document to you that would say this is what we would do or what she would do to manage the wildlife and this is the procedures we would follow and that she would be given uh, authority uh, through this uh, document to you know take action um, so I think if, if there are questions she would know better because she's had a lot more detailed que uh, conversations but I think ultimately there would be a plan that the airport board would look at and then the council would, would also look at. Um, beyond that, I, I don't know, okay, are you needing something sooner than later? I've had three year members in the last three years in the parks. Um, I have already been issued a permit if needed to remove the crane legally. I don't want to do that. My hands are tied to the point where I cannot cut off fireworks or shoot off anything because of the ordinance. That's why I would like to implement or hope to implement the FAA H the WHFP plan as a plan. It's all encompassing plan of looking at having wildlife management the right things with the habitat modification and with the exclusions for active entrapments, and it's necessary to do that. But because the problems come up and they just happen, I don't have time to be able to get the, I would like to be able to take care of the problem. So and with implementing the wildlife program, it, like I said before, it kind of binds my hands. I can't just go out and shoot everything. I don't want to. This gives me the guidelines to be able to do my job the airport under regulation to follow the federal regulations. And the other thing I'd like to throw out there too is I've had 22 years of experience in veterinary medicine, which is, you know, <laughs> my whole life has been saving animals. I just want to keep everybody safe. I want to do it to the best of my ability. I spoke with officers that are willing to come out and help with me, help me take care of the problem and help with it. Um, so I am looking into resources. implementing a program which we should have in place with the hazard program that kind of helps you and you feel comfortable with me being, being able to do my job. Quick explanation. So normally what we do what we would do here is run it through the airport board uh, and have them weigh in on this but uh, given that uh, something needs to be done sooner than later. Um, that's why it's at the council level tonight. If you remember, <coughs> and it's not as, it, it wasn't as, I mean, it, you know, it, when, remember out at uh, Foxfire Golf Course, we gave permission for uh, them to discharge a firearm to scare the geese away and stuff like that, and it, and it worked. 
And it is residential out there, just as residential out there as it even probably more so than it is at the airport and so on. So, uh, because I live there, but uh, there, uh, I mean, I I think at the the very least we should um, adopt this policy or plan that she has in place. But I, and I I don't know, uh, John Hart, uh, can we? formally give her permission to disarm firearms without it really being on the agenda tonight? Um, I don't know what she's talking about as a firearm. Unless it shoots a projectile, that isn't a firearm just because it goes boom. It might be a fireworks, but it wouldn't be a firearm. Firearm in our ordinance requires that it be some projectile that's shot off by either explosion spring air gun something like that i don't think that's what she's talking about so i don't know that the device that she's using if it doesn't shoot off a projectile is going to be in violation of our firearms ordinance there's other couple things is the, <clears throat> the fireworks ordinance does limit the use of fireworks if they aren't used for some other use if if they really aren't a firework she isn't using fireworks it's not it's for a, a different use and i don't think it would be characterized as fireworks probably wouldn't come under the fireworks ordinance the only other problem that she has is that there is a noise ordinance and that limits the use of noise explosions etc in various areas most of it applies to streets and alleys close to residential uh, buildings. If she was, if, if the residences around there were far enough away, she probably wouldn't violate that either. So I don't know what other ordinance there would be that she would violate by going out and shooting off the types of noisemakers and various things that she wants to do. It doesn't seem to me that there would be a violation. She wouldn't necessarily need any permission to do that though it would be advisable that she might check and see if, in fact, what she's doing is going to have any projectiles being shot off. That would be the biggest thing. And it sounds like that's not what those things do. They're just noisemakers. And various other noises, not necessarily like a gun. I mean, she's talking about the same kind of thing they use at track meets when they set off a shoot a gun. There's no projectile. There's just a snap gun. I don't, she'd be maybe drawing the line at a couple of these things, but I don't think that she would reach the level of a fireworks <clears throat> or a firearm. So under your opinion, then, she would be free? I, I think so. It, okay. And we don't have enough information here to know just exactly what those devices are, but if she's pretty satisfied that they aren't going to violate those ordinances and they're pretty easy to read, she could just probably eliminate that you gotta understand that to get this thing done properly and to give her permission and do whatever in about 45 days that problem goes away because those birds fly south so she's got a lot of time to figure it out but right now it is imminent and probably needs to do something so that there isn't a problem out there with accidents it so i guess i the only thing that i would say along with that is is that that you know that close neighbors i think we would should notify them. there's a couple of houses right along there that she might want to talk to them and say here's what we're going to do and if they have a problem maybe they have to figure out how they're going to manage it but you're that's a pretty big runway it's a pretty long runways and you get out wherever you're at all those cranes are pretty devious and they can go where you're not but she probably have to get permission from some of the residences on a short-term basis to... okay okay all right uh, and so, Beth, going back to what you, so you understand what Attorney Hart has said today. Um, going back to your request for us to approve this wildlife hazard management plan, I doubt that any of us have had the opportunity to, to really dive into it, fully understand it. Um, is it. Is it something that has to be passed now tonight, or is this something that we can run through your airport board? I mean, because that really isn't going to affect what she's what she needs to do right now. So I 
I mean, I would suggest that we um, probably send this to the airport board and have the airport board go through this. Sandy showed me the size of that. But that has nothing to do with what she wants to do right now. She has plenty of time to get this passed. She's looking at the future to have a plan in place to take care of this in the future. What she needs tonight is is the okay to 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 shoot off a starter gun so that she can or whatever that case might be so that she can try and get rid of the, the cranes and she's already gotten permission to do that so the other part of this plan itself we we have time to make sure that we understand this fully and don't just pass something that none of us really fully understand yet too. so i would advise that we just table this and send it to the to the um, airport board to, to look it over and make suggestions on, on that. If that's all right with the rest of the council. Yeah. All right. So we know what we're doing. We got a plan. Sounds great. And please try to, I know it's extra work for you, but please try to notify the, the neighbors of what's going on out there too. Appreciate that. All right, uh, let's move on then to uh, Josh talked about this a little bit under his comments, but he's looking to uh, increase the spectrum bandwidth upgrade. Okay, we're currently at 200 meg for our bandwidth from spectrum, and we're pretty much very close to maxing that out in the evening. So from the time it takes to get approval here tonight and to get the contract in, all that work done you know, ends up being about a month till we see uh, the increase. So we're looking to move on that to have it in place when we need it. Um, there's a memo in your packet on page 500 detailing it. Um, just as comparison, the price gets better each time when we start with Charter. We were paying just shy of $26 per meg. Um, the proposed upgrade contract for 500 meg totals $2,300 a month or $4.60 per meg. So that keeps going down every time. Um, so it's a good deal. And um, last time I came in with a proposal to upgrade, one of the questions asked is if I got quotes from any other providers. And the only other provider that comes in this building is AT&T. And I think many of you know the history on that. But I did uh, get an unsolicited call this spring from a company that sells bandwidth. And I told them, well, we've only got two lines in the building. And they told me they lease lines from other companies. And I just include as comparison for 500 meg from them, their price was 2209 a month, but they did not include the public IP addresses we need. So it turns out uh, the pricing we are getting from Spectrum is very competitive. Um, so I'm just looking for approval tonight to enter uh, a new three-year agreement with Spectrum, replacing our current agreement to have 500 meg bandwidth. Any questions? Move to approve. Second. Uh, motion by Mayo, second by Keelan, that we approve uh, entering into agreement with Spectrum for 500 megs of bandwidth and two Class C blocks of public IP addresses and an amount not to exceed $2,299. And then this is also the phone? Yeah, so it would be our phone service. It's bundled in there, so both the phone and the bandwidth would be a new three-year deal starting with this gets executed, replacing our current deal. You're okay with that too, Paul and Alan? Yes. Okay. And then also the phone for seven hundred or five hundred and seventy three dollars and forty six cents a month for a total of two thousand eight hundred and seventy two dollars and forty six cents a month for a three year term. Any discussion? Sandy will call the roll. Scott Prochatsky. Aye. Paul Mayo. Aye. Steve Hackett. Aye. Laurie Chestnut? Aye. Alan Keeland? Aye. Dave Peterson? Aye. And Chuck Whitman? Aye. Seven ayes, motion carried. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, next, uh, this is Kathy. It's uh, resolution number 1460. Thank you, Mayor. My reports on page 510. Um, it's a very simple report in that we are closing um, to five. Um, the debt has been paid off of this year and 
any increment um, would be distributed at the um, end of the year next year. And it would add $835,800 in equalized value back to the tax roll, which in the realm of our levy limits is probably about $2,000. <laughs> Um, so, um, but it also adds to the county. It also adds to the district. county and the school district. Right? So, yeah. um, but we're getting there and in, in closing it. So now we're almost um, at 4.2 million back on the tax roll um, between the TIF seven and TIF five. But this is the airport. Um, there are no more um, development agreements or construction. So, um, staff recommendation is to close and terminate this TIF. Right, so Kathy's asking for you to approve uh, resolution number 1416, which is to terminate uh, uh, TID number five. Move to approve 1416. Second. Motion by Keelan, second by Chestnut, that we approve of uh, resolution number 1416. Any discussion? Sandy will call the roll. Dave, Peters Dave Peterson. Lori Chestnut? Aye. Chuck Whitman? Aye. Paul Mayo? Aye. Alan Keeland? Aye. Steve Hackett? Aye. And Scott Berchatsky? Aye. Seven ayes. Motion carried. All right. Thanks, Kat. Uh, next, we have uh, Brennan. Uh, this has got to do with uh, the regional uh, detention basin out by the airport also. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, members of council. Uh, this item was uh, distributed late, um, uploaded on Monday, and Sandy did uh, provide copies to the council this evening and staff for review. Uh, this project was brought forward to the council earlier this year in April when we had received a request for the 48-unit apartment complex out in the East Gateway subdivision area. Um, the thought of creating a, a larger regional detention basin, um, we were looking at providing, uh, I guess, a better service long-term to other developable land that's out there, and also trying to move um, any potential future ponds that may have to be constructed out there away from the airport. Um, a lot of, uh, we do have one wet pond that is out there right now, along with one dry pond that was constructed and created as part of the East Gateway subdivision in the Highway 54 interchange project. Um, as we went through this process, our process we discovered that neither one of those were actually permitted by the FFA or BOA as uh, previously uh, the project uh, I, as we brought forward back in April looked at it, identifying about a, approximately 122 acres that could be serviced by this future regional detention basin when we started going down the design um, road we were again thinking a wet pond but uh, I, I do want to compliment Beth for uh, being um, very proactive through this process and um, actually helping bring the FFA and BOA together along with our consultants and realizing that they were not going to approve a wet pond for this project because of its proximity to the airport. So we had to shift gears and basically redesign the pond to be a dry tension basin, not as as, as aesthetic, and um, but it does drain within 48 hours. Um, because of the cost that was being incurred for this project, um, we did originally estimate around $120,000 for this project, but that because of the size of the basin and the requirements, we did exceed that a little bit. Um, when we move forward with the, the bids that we received last week, we were targeting hopefully around a $200,000 bid for a construction project. This does not include the entire full build out of the pond. We are looking at about a 65% build out of the pond at this time um, if and that will suffice not only for the apartments but about another 30 to uh, 40 developable acres out in the business or out in the industrial park in the east gateway subdivision in the future um, we could expand this pond and so we did design that into the project we did receive bids last week from three qualified contractors and the low bid was r <coughs> r, r wash out of ripon uh, at a cost of 192 835 and 10 cents r r is our current contractor for our city hall and library square reconstruction project um, i did break down the funding uh, for this project internally we are still looking to 
identify uh, the possibility of special assessing some of the property owners out there that would benefit from this project. But at this time, funding for this project would be allocated from TID number eight. We do have funds available to uh, cover the, the construction and the construction of the pond along with any contingency and some additional construction related services for the project. Uh, therefore, this evening, I'm recommending that we award the base bid um, for the project at a cost not to exceed 192,835. And then a total construction project not to exceed 240,835. So we have. Uh, Give me the total dollar amount. The total dollar amount for the construction project, including contingency and construction related services, would be not to exceed two two hundred forty thousand eight hundred thirty five dollars. Two forty five eight thirty five. Correct. All right. Um, yeah, so, uh, and that will come out of TIF number eight. That's TIF number eight, which is a distressed TID that gets money from TIF ten TIF. So there is money in, available from TIF 4 to move over to aid to pay for this. So for the interim, that's going to be paid with TIF 4 money into TIF 8, uh, and then there'll be some later discussion on how that Special. will be reimbursed, I guess. So council will be uh, making another decision at a later meeting on how that will be. Okay, so for tonight, we're looking at uh, the request from Brennan to uh, go ahead and award this bid uh, for an amount not to exceed $244,835. Anybody want to make that motion? Mo so moved. I'll second, but I think the number was 240. Not Two, yeah. 240. Mm -hmm. 240? Did I ask twice? <laughs> 240, 830. Again, I, I used to be good at numbers. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. So we have a motion by Keelan, second by Peterson, that we approve of this bid. Any discussion? This is this yes. is up from the original one twenty. Correct. When we first when that was the very initial <laughs> estimate that had been drafted by uh, staff, but as we got into the project, this project does include some uh, corrections to the exi existing ponds that are out there as well. That was discovered during the design phase, and we do have to make some, um, I'll say, changes or enhancements to the existing ponds because this is one entire system out there. So this does work with the existing wet pond along with the existing dry pond, but with new DNR regulations out there and just some, you know, regular sediment um, that has. Um, deposit into the pond we do have to do some additional work in, in the other ponds to incorporate this into one overall system so that's why there's also a cost increase for the project not a money again we did receive a pay the, again we are looking at options for recouping some of the costs for the project. The developer, as part of the development, did pay a one-time $50,000 deposit or fee to the city, so that is helping to reduce the overall cost of this project. So that take it down to then about the 190. We'd be looking right now. We're looking at it with the design and the construction. You're looking at around $200,000 that will need to be uh, within the tent when the project is all said and done. Okay, any other discussion? One more. Is there a money tree on that land? <laughs> well, I, again, um, the city is part of the TIF aid out there, but there are, to, to, to keep it simple, and we've talked about this in the past, so this is not a surprise to you, but we are looking at other options, like assessing the uh, the other property owners out there too, but we need more time. They staff needs more time 
to figure that out. So we're paying for this up front so that they can get the apartment building going. And then we do have options that you'll have to make in the future. So we'll get, uh, we could get as most of it back, except for the city portion, of course, because we do have property out there too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And we do need this pond for constructing the apartments, right? For front office. That's correct. The we, intent, right? Correct. We, you know, instead, remind everyone. instead of building upwards of probably, you know, six to eight additional ponds, if all the other land that developed out there in the future, you know, the land that's south of Commercial Drive, the land that's west of this property, and there's uh, land that's east of this property, each one of those property owners would most likely have to construct some form of a pond, which, again, flies heavily in, in uh, against the FAA and BOA. So as an economic incentive to these property owners to help develop their property, we looked at this as creating one regional detention base and taking it as far away from the project as, or from the runway and the airport as possible. Also, you know, trying to enhance what is going on at the Eco Park. So part of the design that's being done out there is incorporating natural plantings, natural flowers into it as well, and working with Andrew's department in the future to continue to enhance some of the um, amenities and they have already been out uh, added out there over the last couple of years. Yeah, well, I'm just trying to remind people that long story short, it's it's kind of a requirement when you do Correct. development to have stormwater control. This is one type. Correct. Why we're doing it. Okay, great. The other, then you'll call the roll. Steve Hackett. Hi. Lori Chestnut. Aye. Dave Peterson. Aye. Scott Pertatsky. Aye. Chuck Whitman. Aye. Paul Mayo. Aye. And Alan Keeland. Aye. Seven eyes. Motion carried. Brennan, thank you. Yep. All right. I think you're still up, though, Brennan. We have a project out in the, also in the TIF. Uh, which one is this now? Six? Three. Three. Okay. TIF number three. Go ahead. Yep. Uh, this item is on page 512 of the packet, and as many of you are aware, the, the school district did contract out bus services uh, to go right away transportation group uh, for a five-year contract. Right now, they for this year, they will be leasing the facility that's adjacent to H.H. Hinder and uh, across the street as well, but they are to vacate that facility after this upcoming school district. They're looking for a permanent location and approach the city of uh, according to land within our industrial park for their bus terminal station and outdoor parking of buses and fleet that they have. Uh, within your packet on page 513 is a proposed location of where we would be looking to locate them. Um, they originally only needed approximately three acres for uh, overall site development, but based upon how the town will pack it comes into our business park, instead of chopping up the property, we just extended it down all the way to the Southern Terminus line. So the property area in red would be uh, what they would be purchasing, which is approximately five acres at a cost of $65,000. We typically uh, market the properties out in the industrial park at $30,000 an acre. However, uh, this this TID closing um, more expenditures, I believe after 2019 as well, they are not seeking any incentive from the city. So as a um, incentive, we are reducing the land cost the front three acres, which would be mostly developed for the building and the parking, um, to fifteen thousand dollars an acre, and then the remaining two acres, which kind of abuts the river and the land that's back off the hill, at ten thousand dollars an acre. You will also see on the map on page five thirteen there is a yellow outlined area, which is an outlot. We would be we most likely are going to have to relocate an existing driveway uh, that services the property in the town of Wapaka. That goes. That dates back to when the city first purchased the farmland years ago for the development of the industrial park. Um, so again, the offers for sixty-five thousand dollars. They're looking to close um, probably by the end of October in or December, and they are looking to actually start construction yet this year because they do need a facility up and operational by June or July of next year. Okay. So you have a recommendation from Brennan Office, Brennan, Brennan Office, to approve this agreement between the City of Opaca. It's offered a purchase between the City of Opaca and 
go right way transportation group. So moved. Motion by Hackett. Second by Chestnut that we approve of the offer to purchase from Go Right Way Transportation Group uh, for an amount uh, of $65,000. Any discussion? I just want to add that you will see us that right now the parcel is not created. We have a contract with the surveyor to create the parcel, and that will be coming forth to the Common Council for approval of that CSM in the next month to month and a half. I, I I have to ask that. So the yellow mm -hmm. is a dr current driveway. It is going to be the proposed relocation of the driveway, the right? Because it it goes right through the lot. Is yeah, right. Why? Right now, the existing driveway is basically at the terminus of South Industrial Drive, and there's not actually no driveway. There's, I mean, it's a vertical curb. They drive over it, but that driveway easement dates back to when the farm uh, Stibbs used to own the entire farm field, and there was an access all the way through. So we will be working with the property owner to the south to relocate that. To relocate it, but we're not responsible for building the driveway. No. We would, no. Okay. All right. Any other discussion? Uh, San Diego, call the roll. Lori Chestnut. Aye. Alan Keeland. Aye. Steve Peterson. Aye. Scott Brichatsky. Aye. Chuck Whitman. Aye. Paul Mayo. Aye. And Steve Hackett. Aye. Seven eyes, motion carried. Thanks, Brennan. <clears throat> uh, next is license report 1417. This is a operator's license. Uh, there are four names on there. Same thing, pending uh, background checks and payments of any fines owed to the city. <laughs> Clerk's office is recommending that we approve license report 1470, so we need a motion to so moved. Second. Motion by Keelan, second by Peterson that we approve license report 1417. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Uh, we need a motion. We do have a closed session plan for tonight, so we need a motion to convene into closed session. So moved. Motion by Hackett. Second. Second by Whitman. That uh, we convene into closed session in accordance with Wisconsin State Statutes 19.85, parent 1, parent E, as it concerns the deliberation or negotiate, negotiating the purchase of public properties, the investing of public funds, or conducting other specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session. Uh, we need uh, Sandy to call the roll. Chuck Whitman. Aye. Paul Mayo. Aye. Dave Peterson. Aye. Scott Pachatsky. Aye. Lori Chestnut. Aye. Steve Hackett. Aye. And Alan Keeland. Aye. Seven ayes. Motion carried.